Okay, hi, good morning everyone. Thank you for watching the Facebook Live together with the National Cancer Society Malaysia as well as Lung Cancer Network Malaysia. So today is just not an ordinary Saturday. Today is World Lung Cancer Day. And in fact, lung cancer continues to be one of the most common cancer globally, including Malaysia. So therefore, Lung Cancer Network Malaysia and National Cancer Society Malaysia has joined force to, uh, supported by Roche Malaysia, is currently creating an educational movement to raise awareness about lung cancer among Malaysians. So without further ado, let me introduce the speaker of today. Today, we have Dr. Anand, a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon. He's also the co-founder and president of Lung Cancer Network Malaysia. We have Dr. Tolaiman, consultant clinical oncologist, also the vice president of Lung Cancer Network Malaysia. And we have Dr. Murali, a public health specialist, medical director of National Cancer Society. So without further ado, I'll pass the conversations to Dr. Murali. Okay, sure. Thanks, Kenneth. So, very good morning, everyone. And, uh, of course, Salam Aidil Adha. I'm sure you all are still enjoying your rendang and lemang and, and everything. So, it's uh, also uh, World Lung Cancer Day. So, happy World Lung Cancer Day. Kind of a weird wish to perhaps uh, share with you. But, yeah, it's, an, it's, it's really becoming an important thing and, and, and uh, very uh, interestingly, today and, and for the next couple of uh, uh, weeks, we, we are very uh, honoured to be able to work together, uh, both of us, uh, National Cancer Society of Malaysia and Lung Cancer Network Malaysia, to bring to you some uh, insights and perhaps just some borak borak kosong about some uh, info pertaining to lung cancer. So uh, two of our eminent colleagues will continue to hopefully join us with uh, few others uh, as well over the coming weeks as we speak about lung cancer directly to you and uh, kind of uh, get some questions and, and uh, give you some answers about lung cancer. So um, the, the first thing really that, uh, that the three of us uh, were, have been chatting about, and I think uh, that would be quite interesting if you put on uh, kind of the, some of the pictures that we have. Uh, is the fact that lung cancer, everybody has this idea that lung cancer is a disease of old men. Uh, old smokers, I think uh, some of us, um, I don't know, uh, some of us who are a little bit older, will remember the X-Files. Uh, I know my nephews and nieces don't even know what that is now. But if you remember the cigarette smoking man from X-Files, that was a very kind of uh, uh, trademark look for for people who chain smoked and got lung cancer. But unfortunately, that's not really the case, isn't it, Dr. Anand? What, what do you think now? It's, it's changed so much. Hi, Dr. Morley, good morning. Very, very much so, I think as, as you just mentioned briefly, you know, we, we all associate it, not just society at large, even us in the medical profession, we associate lung cancer with a smoker's disease and a man's disease. Uh, I mean, the reality is still the vast majority of cases of lung cancer do occur in people with a smoking history. So either they are current or former smoker. But, you know, we, I think all three of us are seeing in our clinical practice, we talk to our colleagues, we are starting to see an increasing number of non-smokers or never smokers, you know, who, who unfortunately are diagnosed with lung cancer. So I think the first thing we want to share with everyone today is that it's important to recognize none of us can afford to be complacent, you know. The cancer doesn't follow any rules. It doesn't mean that if you're, if you're not male, in other words, if you're a woman, or more importantly, if you don't smoke, it doesn't mean that you won't, uh, you know, you're not at risk of developing lung cancer. In fact, uh, uh, I agree totally. In fact, about the Singapore data shows us 30% of their lung cancer occurs in non-smokers. And out of these non-smokers, 70 or 80% of them are women. Women, non-smokers, who tend to be younger. Uh, we don't have the data for Malaysia, but Asian communities, it's about 30%. Wow, that's, that's really a big number. And uh, kind of, uh, I think the, the immediate question like uh, really uh, that pops up is, why do you think these numbers are going up amongst women, really? Is there an idea? I'm sure 
I'm sure it's really something that everyone's been thinking about as well. So I think, you know, um, when the first thing we did, you know, we classified these people as non-smokers and never smokers, but um, how accurate that is, is debatable. You know, for example, uh, you may have, or they may have a spouse or a partner who is a chronic smoker. So, you know, some of these cases of lung cancer in the so-called non-smoker or never smoker, it's inadvertent secondhand passive smoking you know, exposure. They may have a accumulative long-term exposure by virtue of living with a partner or spouse who's a smoker. Or they may be working in an environment, you know, in a culture, an environment, a physical environment where over many, many years or decades, they are, you know, inadvertently exposed to secondhand or passive smoke. And of course, the other area, you know, as Dr. Thor mentioned, there seems to be an over-representation of women and those of Chinese ethnicity amongst the non-smokers who develop lung cancer. Um, you know, there are various theories about this, Dr. Morley, one of which is that it's to do with Chinese style high temperature wok cooking, right? So the fumes that come off, and, and I guess the, the most obvious thing there is, you know, it's not logical to tell people not to cook at home, but you need to do it in a very well ventilated kitchen. Uh, you need to have a good extractor fan. So I think that is one of the uh, points that maybe some of them yeah, they don't smoke themselves, but they're being exposed to secondhand or thirdhand smoke. And I think Dr. Thor, I'm sure they elaborate. The other area, of course, is we know there's a genetic predisposition to lung cancer. We have a higher proportion of all these genetic mutations in Asia compared to the West, you know, molecular mutations. So like all diseases, lung cancer as well, the causation the etiology is multifactorial. You know, it's more than just smoking. Right. Dr. Thor, Dr. Anand was saying something about this whole kind of genetic predisposition, could you kind of uh, give us a little bit more thoughts on that? Okay, so I think we have to be clear whether the genetic predis the genetic mutation involved is something inherited from your from your father and mother, which is germline, or whether that mutation happens in due to exposure to environmental factors and that's not inherited that is uh, that is unique to the individual in their course of history in their life so we don't know what the genetic factors are in terms of inheritance in fact we haven't worked that out yet in terms of lung cancer so if your parents have lung cancer you don't necessarily have a higher risk of lung cancer however the in asia we see a lot of uh, EGFR genetic mutation, epidermal growth factor receptor, up to 50% of our patients have that mutation, uh, as opposed to the West, where it's only 15%, 50 versus 15%. And we still do not know why. It could be due to all the factors we talked about uh, that are unique to Asia, our, our environmental exposure, but we don't know why. Wow, so uh, the first insight today is uh, perhaps don't have so much of wok hay in your cooking. <laughs> I say the more you char, uh, it looks like the more exposure you're getting to any kind of environmental, uh, uh, how to say, uh, driver towards uh, muta mutagenesis perhaps of, of uh, your cells. Wow, so I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Kenneth to kind of put on the first picture and I think we were speaking about this and perhaps just to share with, with everyone the, the first uh, thing. So um, doc, Dr. Anan uh, and Dr. Tho were both saying about how this is a kind of uh, the typical picture that we're having. Uh, Dr. Tho, you were, you were going to say something about this. And then I think uh, the next picture is really what you were speaking to us today. This guy looks a bit like Anna Schwarzenegger, right? He's very muscular. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, he's, he's a bit atypical. He looks too fit. Yeah, normally our uh, I mean, our patients don't look like that. Unfortunately, yeah. that's, yeah. that's but, true. I'm interested yeah. to see but, your uh, next picture, Kenneth. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is Kenneth's girlfriend. No, no, not yet. Okay, anyway. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to advise right. her to stop right. smoking, yeah. Kenneth. <laughs> Yeah, so, but you were saying, Dr. Toh, this is now perhaps a picture that we need to be a little concerned about um, in the sense that uh, this may be, or is, is it already 
the look of people of, of an individual uh, who may be a candidate who, to pick up lung cancer? Actually, while the incidence of smoking in men is decreasing, in parts of the world, for example, China, the incidence of smoking amongst women is increasing. So that's a worrying trend. We will, that, that potentially will, will result in a lot more lung cancer in 10 or 20 years' time. Uh, but yes, I mean, women, non-smokers, or so-called non-smokers, but Dr. Anand uh, very clearly pointed out that there's a role of passive smoking, uh, seem to be a significant proportion of our patients nowadays. Right. And also for those who are kind of need to, this to be rooted a little more uh, panas uh, or more current uh, situation, uh, you will look up, and Dr. Anand has written quite a bit on this in, in recent months, on this whole connection of smoking to COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Perhaps some, some like a short uh, insight on, on this, that would be helpful as well. Sure. I think just, I mean, today's agenda is obviously to highlight lung cancer. But very briefly, given we're amidst an evolving pandemic, you know, there was, uh, there is concern as to smoking and you know, smoking obviously causes a variety of lung diseases. And COVID-19, we're now learning it's more than just, uh, you know, it seems to predominantly target the lungs, but, you know, it affects many organ systems. And one of the things we've learned is uh, this uh, clot formation, thrombosis or clot formation, micro and, ma and macro vascular affecting the small and big blood vessels throughout the body, and hence the importance of steroids, the importance of anticoagulation, blood thinning. But in the context of smoking and, and COVID-19 and lung cancer, very briefly, what we do know is that uh, if you, you know, there was, there was some suggestion based on very preliminary data that perhaps smokers were protected, you know, paradoxically as if smoking protected against COVID-19, that is absolutely untrue, you know, and what I think, the, the, very briefly, the point to get across is that there is sufficient data now from, from many parts of the world that for people who are chronic active smokers, if you do contract uh, coronavirus and get COVID-19, you're more likely to have a more severe manifestation of the disease, more likely to end up with severe illness, you know, you may require admission to the ICU, may require uh, ventilation, and even a worse outcome, including death. So there's no rationale or logic. There is no protective effect for smoking with COVID-19. And uh, I think that's right. all I highlight at, at this point. Okay, lovely, doctor. So really, if there's no incentive for you to stop smoking because you're not worried about getting lung cancer what, 20 years from now, uh, getting COVID next week might be an incentive for you to kind of quit, uh, perhaps. Anyway, but just, just bringing this back into, into World Lung Cancer Day, um, I think uh, Ken might be a, a good a good uh, point to kind of put up on next slide, and I'm going to ask Dr. To to kind of go through why really are we bothered about lung cancer? Is it such a big problem? Everyone speaks about breast cancer, and really breast cancer is our number one cancer. So um, really, is lung such a big problem, Dr. To? What do you think? Because it's a it's a it's a deadly cancer. Um, it kills more people than breast colorectal and prostate cancer combined. It's one of the, it, I think it's the top two highest mortality cancers in the world. And that's the reality of it. I mean, uh, in Malaysia, 93% are diagnosed in stage three and four. So diagnosed quite late. If you're diagnosed in stage one or two, uh, you can have surgery. Uh, and Dr. Anand is, is an expert in cardiothoracic surgery. And we can uh, remove the tumor and aim for cure. But when you're in stage four, you know, the prospects of cure are, very, are almost uh, nil. Uh, so I think it, because of its uh, daily nature and the fact that it's picked up late, it translates into very poor survival rates. It has the worst survival rate uh, of among all the cancers in Malaysia. And, and really, I think that's, that's uh, something that uh, should strike home. Look, we, I mean, even going by the numbers, as you can see from the graph, as really it's the top three cancer. And, uh, and uh, even worse is what uh, Dr. To is now telling us that really when you get it, it, you often get diagnosed really late with it. And as a result of that, um, you see really 
bad outcomes. As you can see, I think um, Dr. Tho was, was talking to you us a little bit about this. And really, Dr. Tho, would you, kind, would you kindly kind of give us a bit more data based on this slide? You were saying, and this is shocking, but 91% present in stage four, yeah? So what's, what's in, in terms of, um, who, okay, like I come in stage two or I come in stage three, what's the difference? Okay, so um, we have to give you the bad news first before we give you the good news, lah. Okay, so th the bad. This is the bad news. The bad news is historical. That means we have a lot of um, uh, data that has come out from historical records. That means this is records. What we see now, the percentages, come from what has happened uh, over the past ten years or so. So that's how we get all this uh, data. However, the good news, okay, so the good news, so whenever uh, you, when you tell someone something, they always say, give two positives for every negative. So the good news is we have much better treatments nowadays for lung cancer. We have immunotherapy, we have targeted therapy, we have better surgery, we have much better radiotherapy. So I think we all work together, we detect it earlier, we treat uh, the patients more aggressively, I think this graph will look very different in 10 and 20 years time. Okay, okay, doctor. I'm actually going to ask Kenneth to go back one slide and ask Dr. Anand a, a, a really burning question that I always get asked because uh, this is the Malaysian data, this is the way it's presented in the registry and everybody uh, who looks at this slide who's, who's not really a medic will ask you, hey, got tracheal cancer got bronchus cancer, why all these cancers are kind of lumped into the lung cancer group. Maybe Dr. Anand can enlighten us a little bit on what this thing is about. Sure. So, I mean, the, I think it's this is an international classification. So, when you talk about lung cancer, broadly speaking, bronchogenic carcinoma, lung cancer, it's classified internationally as trachea bronchus in the lung. The trachea is the medical term for our windpipe, right? Our main airway, uh, basically, which then divides supplying airway to the right and left lung, which we call the right and left main bronchus, and then to the lungs. So that's sort of the nomenclature of the description. Um, I just very briefly want to mention the slide that Kenneth showed. Actually, it's got a bit worse since. That was for 2007 to 2011. Earlier this year, we just came out. When I say we in Malaysia, the government has published, the National Cancer Institute published the most contemporary and actually, it's around 93 to 94%, not 89 to 91. So it's about 93 to 94% of men or women in our country wow. are now diagnosed at stage three and stage four. And, you know, in very wow. simple terms, right, I think everybody, our listeners, hopefully will all appreciate all cancers, including lung cancer, the treatment and the actual prognosis, meaning the survival outcome is very, very much stage dependent. It is one of the most important predictors. So if we're picking it up in almost 95% of cases, we're detecting it too late, then, then we've kind of missed the boat in that sense, you know? So that's the point, you know? And in terms of our local survival data, uh, for those of you who are football fans, think of the Premier League table. Lung cancer is always in the, it's not even in the bottom three. It's, it's basically the worst performing of all the solid cancers. I think only pancreatic cancer for stage one performs worse five-year survival. But for all other stages and all other cancers, lung cancer is bottom of that league table. So it's a deadly cancer. It's a fatal cancer, but largely because we're picking it up too late. Right. And perhaps just on that note, can I, no, why don't we switch that slide? I'm going I'm, I'm to ask Dr. To, uh, because uh, Dr. To touched on this a little bit. Doctor, is there, and, and perhaps Dr. Arnon subsequently as well, really, why is it that we are so bad at picking this up at 3%? I probably have a better chance of throwing stones at people in the road and hoping I hit someone with lung cancer, you know. Why, why are we just really this bad at picking it up? Is there a reason for it? Okay, uh, Kenneth, do you have a slide on the symptoms? Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, no slide on symptoms because the symptoms of lung cancer are easily confused. Oh, sorry. One back. Are easily confused with uh, normal illnesses. So a cough that doesn't go away, uh, pain in the chest, uh, nickels in the chest, a bit of weight loss. I think, 
I think the public as well as doctors can sometimes misdiagnose such patients and may not necessarily think of lung cancer as the first thing that jumps to mind. They may think it's a chest infection. In this part of the world, tuberculosis is very common, you know, things like that. So that is one reason, maybe a lack of uh, awareness that lung cancer is very, very common in the society. And I think the second thing that uh, I see in my practice is that people feel that the message is lung cancer is deadly, lung cancer is fatal, no point treating. So I think that's not the message we want to get out there. I think uh, nowadays we, we have very, very, very excellent treatments. I think Dr. Murali, uh, is, uh, NCSM is an excellent advocate for allowing greater access to, to drugs and medication and therapies. Uh, of course, uh, there's a cost issue, but, uh, but I think uh, we are making a lot of progress. There are, we have our five-year survival rates for lung cancer, despite being three or four, has virtually tripled uh, or even more in some cases. And we're bringing these treatments into stage one and two and preventing people from getting, after the, uh, having the surgery, from getting lung cancer back. So I think two things. One, we have to do away with the nihilism uh, with lung cancer. And two, we have to recognize that lung cancer is common. And we really, really have to think about uh, this diagnosis. Okay. But the, and and that, those are really, really important points that I think people need to take, um, understand a little bit that uh, one, uh, I think not all these really minor looking respiratory symptoms when you have a cough that never goes away, uh, kind of a bit of weight loss, uh, but actually really persistent kind of respiratory symptoms. Well, um, maybe either Dr. Anand or Dr. To, either one of you, what's kind of like a cutoff point that you would think like after about a week or two weeks or three weeks or a month, um, and, and maybe just like, okay, should you, because you, you know, and this is really sad, but uh, all of us do this. When we have the first four or five days of a chest cold, we borrow our children's cough medicine. And then after about a week, your wife will scold you. We'll go to one GP for about two days, not take the medicine, wait another couple of days, go to a pharmacy. And, you know, we end up about two months or something nursing a, a long cough, uh, which never goes away. And you've seen all these people at like weddings or functions and they'd always tell you, oh, you know, I've been to see about six or seven doctors. But sometimes um, there's a very poor understanding of how to progress in terms of when do I need to reach a cardiothoracic surgeon? When do I need to reach an oncologist? When do I need to do something else beyond going to see another uh, doctor telling him another story altogether just to get MC for that day? You know, it's, it's uh, uh, maybe both, both of you gentlemen would like to take your turns kind of share uh, some ideas on this? I think um, the short answer, Dr. Murali, in terms of the cutoff is most, most, uh, you know, most of us would probably recommend about two weeks. I guess we kind of have right. to be, uh, you know, quite um, proportionate, you know. So over, you know, over the course of a year, all of us probably get a cough or cold, you know, or, you know forget COVID as well, just in normal situations. So. Uh, we're not advocating or asking people if you have a cough for two days, you know, run off to see your GP or specialist. But I think most guidelines and most of us who practice, right, would suggest if you have a troublesome or persistent cough that doesn't resolve within two to maximum three weeks, you've got to go and see a doctor, whether it's your local trusted GP or relevant specialist. And for, you know, a lot of people who are smokers, they may have a chronic cough. So we talk about a change in the nature of the cough or if you're coughing up blood, which is in medicine, we call this hemoptysis, then that is something that just cannot be ignored. And it's a very low threshold. And to be honest, this is a message, not just for, you know, the general public, for our viewers, but it's also for all of us, you know, fellow doctors. We, we sometimes tend to dismiss the symptoms of the signs. As Dr. To said, it's often very non-specific, very vague, easy to dismiss. Uh, but I think two to three weeks would be the threshold at which uh, or some you know, referral to a doctor, and as a minimum, probably a chest x-ray, as, as a minimum baseline investigation. Yeah. Right, and I think um, one of the, the, the strong points that Dr. To put across was this mix of uh, behavior in the sense that one on one side, you've got this idea that look, I can, it's not me, I can never get lung cancer, it's, it's not for me, it's for some old guy. 
uh, you know, who's been smoking for 20 years. And the other is that you also are switching off within your mind the idea that, oh, you know, if I get lung cancer, it's going to be really bad. So I cannot get lung cancer. Uh, Dr. Do, any ideas really on, on how to deal with this? Or really? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, I treat lung cancer and breast cancer as well. So yeah. I, I'm wondering whether it's something to do with whether it's you're a man or woman. So I think health-seeking behavior of, of, of women are perhaps a little bit more assiduous. That means they're more interested in taking, uh, looking at early signs and symptoms and catching things early. Whereas men are a little bit more blasé, isn't it? It's like, you know, you'll go away. I'll just see my doctor tomorrow. Or, and then tomorrow never comes, right? Uh, perhaps it's something to do with uh, gender. Uh, perhaps... I, but I think it's a lot to do with fear. I mean, eventually when I speak to my patients, I drill down to why, you know, there was a delay in diagnosis. There's a huge fear in terms of treatment that stems from the fact that uh, people believe lung cancer is universally fatal. There's no cure and there's no point treating. The, tr the treatment is very, very painful. So I think, I think we have to debunk that. We have to debunk that and we have to debunk that strongly. Right. And really, I think one of the major things that we need to take away from today is the fact that, look, uh, sure, lung cancer is, is bad. It's a bad disease to have, but um, catching it and treating it is now not a death sentence, you know, and a lot of people are coming out of it with better, uh, better quality of life. In fact, they're living longer as well. And as Dr. To and Dr. Anand are both telling us, uh, really, the treatments are, I think, worlds apart from, say, about 10 years ago. Right. So um, I, I'm just going to uh, go on and ask the next question, maybe uh, either uh, Dr. To or Dr. Anand, out of curiosity. So let's say I do think that there's something wrong with me. I suspect that I do have lung cancer. Um, how do I actually kind of uh, diagnose it? Okay, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll, okay, I'll start. Anyone, anyone, anyone. And I'll let Dr. Toh continue. So I guess there's only two ways, two pathways. One is, you know, if a person, if you are, as Dr. Toh said, health-seeking behavior. So you, you're diagnosed incidentally. In other words, you go for a checkup or you have an x-ray or a scan for some other reason and something gets picked up incidentally by chance on your x-ray or CT scan. Or you go for right. executive health screening. But we'll, so that kind of then follows a set path, but perhaps we look at the more likely scenario where you are developing symptoms. So you would perhaps have a cough or you've been losing weight or getting more breathless, or tired, or having some form of chest pain that we call pleuritic chest pain, worse on deep breathing and coughing, perhaps even coughing up blood. So you have symptoms or uh, some form of respiratory or chest symptoms prompts you, prompts that person to, to see a doctor, usually to be your primary care GP. He or she will okay. probably arrange as a, as, a, as a baseline an x-ray. So if the x-ray is abnormal, or if the x-ray is normal, the chest x-ray, but the clinical suspicion remains there, the next step will be to have a CT scan, a CT scan of the chest or thorax. And uh, again, this is, uh, the technology is very advanced and uh, it can be done very quickly with minimal radiation dose. And it's very, very sensitive as an investigative tool. And obviously, if the CT scan shows something in the lung that is of concern, that we are suspicious of a possible lung cancer, the next step is to get a biopsy. So a biopsy means to get a sample of the, the tissue, whatever that mass or whatever that nodule is in the lung or that's visualized on the scan. Now, the biopsy is usually done in one of two ways. It's either done from the inside out. So if, it depends on the location of the mass. So if it's very towards the middle, what we call as the uh, central, then perhaps it is more accessible through a scope, a bronchoscopy, which is usually done by the chest physician, or in America, they call them pulmonologists. If on the other hand, the mass or nodule is more peripheral, that means it's more towards the outside of the uh, lungs, the outer edges, mm -hmm. then it's more amenable or more accessible through uh, a biopsy. Usually it's called a CT guided biopsy. That's done by an interventional radiologist. To give a bit of sedation, a bit of local anesthetic, stick in a needle and take a sample of tissue. And that's sent off to the pathologist who will put it under the microscope. 
And, and that's the key. We want to try and determine this mass, confirm or exclude a lung cancer. So I think that's the, the key point in terms of trying to establish the diagnosis. Perhaps Dr. Do will then talk a little bit about how the next step, if we do confirm lung cancer, about what we call as the staging and the investigation from, from there in terms of the extent of spread. Naiman? Yeah, so, so once we've established the diagnosis of lung cancer, we've confirmed it, the next step is we need to know whether that lung cancer has spread to other parts of the body because that will influence the kind of treatment we will be talking to the patient about. So that can either be done using a CT scan or a PET CT scan, uh, positron emotion tomography. Uh, and in some cases, we need to scan the brain as well uh, by doing an MRI scan of the brain. Uh, once we've done that, we can then determine the stage, the stage of the tumor. The staging depends on how big the tumor is, whether it's gone to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body. Right. And uh, subsequently, then you, you start looking at starting treatment. Uh, at, uh, I, I know we, we, we've planned to have this session much, much later because it's quite a topic that's in-depth. But I think, Dr. To, if you could mention a few words as well, because uh, about all these different mutations that we now start looking for and how that influences treatment, uh, because that, and that's really part of diagnostics as well, isn't it? Yes, uh, absolutely. I think... Uh, universally now, we would probably recommend patients uh, that have a spot of the tumor that's been removed to be tested for genetic mutations. So mutations in the DNA that actually cause the tumor to develop in the first place because we have drugs that can target uh, the cells these mutations. And a lot of these uh, Targeted therapies are tablets that people take very conveniently at home once a day uh, or twice a day. And, uh, you know, it, it represents a, a paradigm shift. We used to think of lung cancer as a disease needing to be in hospital where people had chemotherapy, lost their hair, felt horrible. But I think increasingly that's not the case. We have many, many other options. Right. right. And, and more about that in weeks to come. So advertisement. Uh, advertising for, for future weeks, but yeah, so, but entirely really this, uh, the idea of, of molecular uh, diagnostics and really how it's really changed the entire universe of treating lung cancer is something we all need to, to know about. But so I'm, I'm just going to come back to Kenneth's beautifully prepared slides uh, and, and uh, ask another question I think, to all of you, because in the flow of it, uh, we talked about if you started having symptoms and then we, we went into how you diagnose the disease. But really, uh, maybe Dr. Anand can share with us on, and I know Dr. Anand is a big uh, kind of, uh, and Lung Cancer Network is a, is a big proponent of this, in the sense that we need to actually get people to start screening for the disease as well. And uh, really, Dr. Anand, why don't we just wait for symptoms? Cheaper one. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Unfortunately, a lot of people think like that, isn't it, Dr. Morelli? So. Yeah. I think that's the whole idea. That one of the earliest slides Kenneth shared with all of us showed that, that initial presentation. When, you know, when our fellow Malaysians are first diagnosed in this country, it's closer to 95%, I think, in stage three and stage four, where you know, often you're beyond the realms of a cure. What Dr. Thor is saying is absolutely true. There's been tremendous advances, right, in chemo, immunotargeted therapy. But the point is, some, you get people to live longer and better, but it's still non-curative. When you pick it up early, potentially it's very, very curable. So, by the time we wait for symptoms to develop, it's often too late. And in the early stages of the disease, uh, you know, often they're very, as we discussed earlier, they're either very minimal symptoms, non-specific, or no symptoms. So hence this concept of screening, which is to try and pick up the disease in the preclinical or pre-symptomatic. In other words, you're not even a patient, you're a person. You haven't had symptoms. You want to pick it up early. And you know, uh, you're right. I mean, LCNM is, is pushing this agenda because there's strong science here, two major international trials, one from the US, one from Europe, which has now provided strong scientific evidence that screening of high-risk individuals is cost-effective. We can reduce the death rate, the mortality, lung cancer-specific mortality. And, and probably, you know, if we, if we just look at it holistically, it, it probably is going to be cost-effective to society as well. So what we have done is we have looked at some of the scientific data from US and from Europe, these two big trials, 
and tried to tweak it a little bit, taking into consideration our local epidemiology here in Malaysia in terms of demographics. And we advocate actually probably around 45 to 75 years of age is the group that may benefit from screening, provided you have a smoking history. That means you've been a smoker or a former smoker for at least 20 years duration. Now, you know, unfortunately, that means we're going to leave out a very obvious group for purposes of screening. You know, we don't know how to capture or target the non-smoker, which is what we all talked about at the start of this session. But when we talk about screening, we're talking about population-based. So we have to be as scientific as we can and, and cast the net wide, but it's got to be cost-effective. So the science, together with our local data, suggests we should push screening for people who have been smoking, current or former smokers, at least 20 pack years. That means one pack of cigarettes a day for at least 20 years. Or if you smoke two packs a day for 10 years, that's a 20 pack year history. And in that age group, below 40 or 45, the incidence of lung cancer is exceptionally low. Doesn't mean we all know patients who are much younger than that who've had lung cancer, but for purposes of screening, not cost effective. And equally, there's no point in screening 80 year old uncle and picking up a lung tumor because he may die of old age. He may be biologically insignificant. We're just going to add to his anxiety or he may not be fit enough for any treatment. So it's that age group with that risk factor of smoking that we want to um, you know, get this out there that uh, people who fall into this category are deemed to be high risk. Please. Uh, you know, see a doctor to give consideration for screening. That's one of the important points because otherwise we'll pick it up too late. Okay, and I'm, and I'm maybe going to build on what Dr. To was saying earlier about how women generally have better health-seeking behavior. And uh, considering that largely smokers in Malaysia are still male, I think the message for today needs to go out to wives. As much as you torture your husbands to do everything else, uh, if they're a smoker, you know, I think one of the things that you should slowly start uh, while, while serving them their uh, nasi lemak or chicken curry, slowly like, oh, you know, it's probably worth to go out and get a, a, a low dose CT scan as a screen, perhaps as a baseline, uh, if you haven't done one already. Would that, so do you think that would be something that we could kind of convince the Malaysian wives to kind of push on to their husbands. Of course, we're not telling all of us are uh, bad men, but you know, men are generally worse at taking care of ourselves. Men will never get anything done unless, you know, they have a woman pushing them, isn't it? I think we need to extend right. that to Merli to not just wives, mistresses, girlfriends, daughters, that they're the significant yep, yep, exactly. in their lives. Absolutely. I think we, we all yep. say it in our practice where, you know, Sorry, I'm being a bit sexist, but as a man... Okay, for all the women out there, stop cooking the, your husband's favourite chicken curry until they get seen by a doctor. <laughs> that, that, is, that, that is... And Dr. Anand uh, kind of pointed out the really the power of the daughters as well. So really... Uh, daughters, uh, daughter, yeah, yeah, because they've got all their fathers wrapped around their little fingers. So, you know, it's probably a good time to give them to kind of advocate for them to advocate out. to their dad. Yep, yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, the pockets, of course. Yep, yep. And and really, uh, uh, I think, um, again, uh, perhaps uh, because you guys are a little, uh, not, I'm sure you, you guys are really humble people. So I, I, you can't blow your own trumpet, so let me blow it for you. Uh, Lung Cancer Network has been instrumental, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all over Malaysia to kind of work out with hospitals how to provide low-dose CT scans they just uh, ran a big campaign as well uh, over the last couple of months. And I think, we, I, I, do you continue to extend that now? Yeah, I'm I mean, kind of pushing down the cost we, of screening. Yeah, I mean, on that note, just to, to say we are honored and delighted to collaborate with National Cancer Society of Malaysia as well, you know, such a well established NGO. And it's all about all of us working together to try and up our game, isn't it? And increase the awareness, make lung cancer part of that, you know, conversation wider. Yeah in wider society. But yeah, we are planning to uh, try and promote more screening and perhaps have a more sustained campaign this year, Dr. Murley. But you know, starting from today, gradually build up towards November, which is World Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we'll be doing, as you know, stuff with you guys as well um, to get that message out there. I think it's a slow burn that hopefully collectively as we work together, we will perhaps see the benefit in terms of that stage migration, that more 
hopefully more people will stop smoking and more cases that are that happen will be picked up at an earlier stage and therefore better outcomes that's that's the end game so we we hope to do a more sustained campaign this year correct right i i just want to run a, a quick math uh, maybe dr to dr anand what's an average low dose ct scan price actually for those who are curious to know just just a mean kind of in in malaysia how much would it cost in i i think uh the cost varies according to the hospital i think yep. uh, initially malaysia ran a clinical trial for low dose ct scan mm-hmm. which was provided free of cost sponsored uh, but they didn't recruit enough uh, patients in the private sector we are talking anywhere between 300 to 500 i think i believe wow that's ridiculous because as i'm running the math that works out to be about 1 ringgit 50 cent per day over the course of an entire year look that's really less than the price of one cigarette stick right so yeah you know uh yeah and and maybe that's really a investment worth making uh over over this point in time so um i am actually going to um be a little conscious of time because i know we we've said we, we it's impossible to do it this in half an hour we'd love to talk in for for about 4 hours but you know we're trying to keep these sessions maybe a little short and and crisp so we're going to see if we have any questions and and uh, do we have any questions ken hi doctor uh yes we do apparently is like mail is okay. holding the fork to organize the webinar today by all four mails uh presents here and then all the questions from the audience seems to be female so now let me read some of the questions from the audience so there's the first question hey, asking hello, to see you kenneth <laughs> there's the first question <laughs> asking like is smoke and films from cooking uh is toxic okay so maybe either one of you gentlemen want to want to take that incense is it what 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 was the question Uh, another question will be on incense but it's just asking gener- in general smokes and films from cooking perhaps in the process of making food like just now we mentioned about wok frying is that will be causing uh, toxics to us yeah so so the studies were actually uh, some of these studies actually came from singapore where they checked the urine of people, of of women who fry uh, they a lot of wok frying and found some chemicals in the urine so clearly there was some sort of association they also checked the food that was wok fried uh, and the there were some chemicals in the food as well so whether this comes from the high temperature or whether it's the composition of the wok itself or uh, uh, whether it's the effect of the high temperature on the food we don't really know Uh, Doctor, so just okay. to clarify, the wok here. Do you refer just to the black color wok or uh, any other kind of wok? You're testing my cooking knowledge. I don't know why you're talking. <laughs> oh, because it's Chinese style yeah, cooking. Right. Usually, there's a black <laughs> yeah. color. Uh, it looks like the one that uh, on the roadside is the chakui tiao type. So yeah. it's a black color. Yep. So perhaps uh, you may be referring to that particular one. So that some some. I, I don't think be. the studies. Uh, I don't think the studies were detailed enough. I see. to go into uh to to go into that uh, but hopefully we have more research coming yeah. okay right. so and let I me think move one, if i could just interject into yeah. that and just add why uh, dr tos uh, insight is really important is that in earlier years in the 80s and all that you found that a lot of lung cancer in china and all this uh, in bangladesh and all that was driven by wood cooking wood fire and and uh, and those kind of stones were driving uh, lung cancer in women so now to find these results from singapore which i'm assuming there's no more wood fire cooking going on anywhere uh, really shows that even in our houses our apartments our homes in malaysia and the way that we cook also may prove to be kind of a, a risk factor that we need to think about seriously sorry can you're saying the next question maybe dr anand can take that yes this next questions will be going to dr anand as he mentioned so this question is uh, how about the smoke from the incense i mean I, these are all various theories you know i think um, in east asia right can which means hong kong japan korea and and i guess uh, even singapore and, and i guess you know we're seeing a high proportion of lung cancer in that non smoker happening in, in the women and in chinese 
ethnicity. So that's the theories that, you know, the incense joystick burning in the house, the Chinese style high temperature wok cooking, but we don't know for sure. I have to say, I'm not an expert in terms of what are the constituents, but I think they all emit fumes and smokes, and, you know, uh, potential carcinogens, that means cancer causing things. So, you know, we all have cultural uh, practices Nobody is suggesting to stop doing that. I think uh, as a minimum, make sure whatever we do, uh, have a well-ventilated room, have an extractor fan or a well-ventilated room. And it might be that we are, you know, that there are other factors at play we haven't identified, you know, uh, and maybe, maybe a genetic thing. So as Dr. Tho said, a lot of the data is still pending, but um, if, if we're gonna do these activities, certainly have a well-ventilated, uh, a room or environment at least is what I would advise. Yep. Okay, cool. So we have one more question. I believe this is also questions from a lot of audience about secondhand smoke. So there's the audience asking, is it advisable for a non-smoker who's living with a heavy smoker and she's uh, below 50? Would you advise this person to get screening? Maybe uh, Dr. Very Toh, yeah, or Dr. Amanda. Okay, I'll let Dr. Toh go first. Uh, <laughs> you want to take Screening is your, your, your yeah, no, in the know. Yeah, no, to be honest, uh, the honest answer is we don't know. This is a question we are often asked in our clinical practice, sometimes by your neighbours, your friends. Very, very good question, commonly asked. The truth is we don't know, you know. Um, but because we're pushing screening, we have to be scientific and we have to be ethical and do things appropriately. So for purposes of screening, targeting a population, that means you're, you yourself are not unwell, you're not a patient, you have no symptoms. We have to, be, we have to apply science. And therefore we, we advocate that age group, 45 to 75 smoker, former smoker of a certain smoking history. But, you know, uh, of course you have opportunistic screening in Malaysia, the healthcare system is such, anybody can walk into any hospital and ask for these tumor markers of this scan. I think we can't here say, you know, go for screening if you're outside that criteria. The reality, of course, is, you know, we are frustrated and we hope over time there will be evidence to support, to recommend screening for the non-smoker. That The case can just describe the lady who's, you know, who's probably had long-term exposure to smoking, right? Secondhand smoke because of her husband or partner. So, um, but right now, you know, we still have to stick to the science. And uh, on that point of screening, if I can just, I know we're short on time, very briefly, the technology has evolved a lot. So we're talking about low dose CT. And it's really something that people who feel that they need, should see a doctor, obviously, to determine their risk. And if the doctor feels they should have a scan, and you know, it's a collective decision, the, sc the, the actual screening is very effortless. There's, there's, they don't put in any drip or branular or cannula. They don't need to fast. They can walk into whichever hospital and do the scan. So no fasting required, no prior blood tests required. The technology is very, very good. It's rapid acquisition, done very quickly, painless. Even a more elderly patient who can't hold their breath can do the scan. So it is different from you know, conventional CT scan. And the radiation dose is also extremely low. So I just wanted to give a shout out for the concept of screening to whoever is listening. Yeah. I, I guess that would be and, great. And, uh, yeah. so, did, you, did you have any more, Kenneth? Uh, we do. Can we any take more? Uh, more questions? We, we can take one more, one more. And then, so for the rest uh, of people who are sharing on Facebook, we'll do what we always do, which is uh, as your questions come in and, and as the videos go up, we will just Call, uh, collate them and then maybe come back to Dr. Anand and Dr. To kind of get their input and then we'll share it on, on Facebook as, as uh, written answers, like, which we always do with our other sessions. Okay, should, should I okay, uh, get the to last the last one. question? Okay, yeah. last yeah. question is uh, again about the cooking style. So with the recent, uh, a lot of uh, cooking utensil has been improved and this person is actually asking, how about air fryer? Would it actually cause or increase our risk towards uh, cancer exposure? Perhaps Dr. To can take the answer, uh, questions. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. Why don't I take this question since I do so much cooking and I'm so good at <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think air fryers are, are better, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, you're using convection air as opposed to really applying, you know, heat to the outside of your food. I think it's probably better. 
I'm just looking at, I mean, just to answer all the questions, someone asked whether chest x-ray is good enough or you need CT or PET scan. I think you probably need a CT or PET scan to do uh, staging. Uh, in clinical trials, most of the follow-up is done using CT scan. So I think chest x-ray probably not good enough. Uh, any advice on diet? I think a lot of questions on diet. I think we don't have a specific do or don't in terms of treat of, of, uh, of a cancer diet. But in general, we would recommend a diet full of fresh food, fruits, uh, not too much supplements because these are actually processed chemicals. It's not just the food, it's a healthy lifestyle. So exercise, uh, enough sleep, good relationships with your, your family and friends, uh, uh, manage stress properly. So all these contribute to a robust immune system. Dr. Anand, maybe some um, parting words for us as well. Yeah, I mean, I just to, again, just to reiterate, firstly, we're delighted LCNM to be collaborating with NCSM. And as you highlighted, Dr. Moli, it's the first in a series of uh, Facebook Live events we will do. It's a huge topic, lung cancer. We could spend days and days on it. So it's just as a, as a starting point. I guess uh, the summary for today, certainly from, from our perspective, is, uh, yeah, let's not be complacent. As a society, don't think if you're if you're you know you're a woman or if you don't smoke that you can't get lung cancer. Unfortunately, it doesn't obey any rules. Both Dr. To and I in our clinical practice, you know, we see patients, you know, in their 20s and 30s, you know, tragically diagnosed lung cancer, non-smokers, women, etc. Secondly, uh, please, and as you rightly said, Dr. Morley, certainly for uh, maybe we have to go through the female, right, because of the poor health-seeking behavior of men. So the daughters, the wives, the, the, the moms, the, the spouses, if your male partner, your husband, your uncle, your dad, you know, is a chronic smoker in a certain age group, you know, perhaps try and initiate that discussion to get him to go and see his local trusted doctor or go to his local hospital to avail of a screening because it could potentially save, uh, save their life, right? You know, in terms of trying to pick up the disease early. I think those are the two things that we want to try and get across that it doesn't discriminate lung cancer, and that there is uh, technology to pick up the disease earlier for the high-risk group. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, it is a very curable disease if we pick it up early with surgery, followed by some uh, additional treatment, uh, which I think we will discuss in, in later session, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so thank you uh, both uh, gentlemen for, for joining. I think the both of us today, me and Ken, and to all, um, actually everyone who's been uh, kind of following the session on Facebook. Oh, so you can feel free to watch it. Subsequently, it's gonna be on Facebook as well. You can watch it as a video. And really this is the first of many more sessions to come on lung cancer as we try to kind of share a little bit of insights on this uh, disease. And uh, just to finish off, on this note, like Dr. To was saying much earlier, look, if your symptoms are there, it could be that it could be something else. It may not be cancer, but it could be cancer as well. So if listen, listen to yourself, listen to your body. And if if you're picking up symptoms which are say lasting more than two weeks, it's really time to get it looked at. On that note, really, thank you very much. Please go and enjoy some more rendang over the weekend and, and have a safe journey back. Please wear your masks and stay safe. Happy World Lung Cancer Day. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll have a nice Thank weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. Have a nice Saturday. Thank you, Ken.